Backyard Green Films is proud to present this episode of Agriculture with your host, Alara Bowman. Alara and her husband, Rick, travel throughout the land in their teardrop trailer that they have nicknamed Maggie, bringing you stories about their travels and the people they meet. They visit farmers, ranchers, and just about anyone who loves putting their hands in the dirt or their feet in stirrups. For the past three years, they have been filming a documentary about heritage breed animals entitled The Holstein Dilemma, Heritage Breeds, and the Need for Biodiversity. In those travels, they have gotten to meet some very interesting people. Here's one of those interviews. Hi, this is Alara, and welcome back to our podcast. Ah, the Christmas goose, a holiday staple. For years, the goose has been the epitome of the holiday meal that the whole family has sat down and enjoyed. When you're reading A Christmas Carol or Dickens or Bronte, the family sits at a table together for that big meal at the finale, and the one thing you might picture them digging into is the Christmas goose. But come to think of it, I've never had a goose for Christmas dinner. And for that matter, I don't think I've ever eaten the regular parts of a goose ever, whether it be Christmas or New Year's or St. Patty's Day. I don't know if I've ever even seen a goose for sale at the butcher counter. I remember my mother looking forward to goose liver pate every Christmas, but don't remember any other part of the bird being served for Christmas or on any other day. We have this huge bird available, and we just eat the liver? Not that that wasn't absolutely delicious, according to my mother. Liver is, quite frankly, the worst part I've ever ingested, no matter which animal you use or what you do to it in my opinion. All you liver fanatics out there, please forgive me, but the only thing worse than eating liver is cooking it to my obviously plebeian palate. But about the rest of the goose, other than the nasty liver going MIA on our tables, why is that? Buying a goose is pretty much a special order type thing, which seems kind of weird. After all, this used to be a ubiquitous thing representing a common family meal across Europe. And my ancestors are pretty much all European, so shouldn't I be doing the Dickens thing by default every Christmas? So, of course, I started looking it up. The high-end foodie site by D'Artagnan has some great information, and it makes you hungry just reading it. In an article on their blog, they mention that geese are naturally migratory, so they've evolved with thicker skin and better fat storage beneath the skin and in the liver. Now that makes sense, as they need to be able to handle the cold that can come along with high altitude travel. And as you can imagine, you might need a bit of muscle to fly thousands of miles every trip. As we know from the turkey podcast, muscle means dark meat. Dark meat, fat layers, so far it's sounding like a really tasty thing. Huh. As far as the taste goes, everything I've read about geese says that it's really, really good. It's one of those animals that likes to naturally forage for different types of nutrition and really go for the green stuff. That leads to a zestier or a gamier meat, I'm told. It's also possible that active foragers generally might have ingested more micronutrients than other animals that eat the same thing all the time every day. The geese that used to come and visit us in our urban backyard would come and swim in the pool for a minute and then go out and graze in the lawn for the next hour and pick up bugs and seeds and berries and roots and shoots as they went. Geese have traditionally been used to clean up the farmstead or to eat the stubble off the field and eat the leftovers from the harvested crops. Again, from my backyard experience, I can tell you that food goes fairly quickly through a goose. This is bad for the pool at my parents' house, better but messier for the lawn, but really good if you're done farming in the fall and you want all the crop leftovers to go back in as fertilizer as the geese walk along and glean what the harvesters missed. One of my favorite things to see as we travel across the country is to see the flocks of geese that migrate through and land in the fields along the way, eating the remains of the crops. It works for everyone, I would think. That's my perspective, but that will definitely be on my list of questions to ask the next time we talk to a crop farmer. So if you're eating an animal, a varied diet in said animal is excellent because we know that nutrition carries forward to the end product. This is really good for us, even if it's not so great for the goose in the end. People since the ancient times have been eating goose for a holiday meal. During the spring and the summer, an animal is born and grows and it gets bigger over the summer. 
In the fall, the harvest occurs, and all the tons of extra vegetation and forage grains and summer and fall seeds and bugs can lead to a pretty much perfectly fattened up and tasty animal by the time you hit the holidays. The farmer gets his land cleared and fertilized, the goose gets plentiful food around the farmyard, and then hopefully the animal meets a quick and painless end by Christmas. I can see why traditionally it makes a lot of sense to have a Christmas goose. But all of this is leading up to today's podcast. The guy we're introducing you to today is pretty much the man when it comes to all things goose, duck, or waterfowl. His name is John Metzer, and his company is Metzer Farms, which is located in Gonzales, California. From his place, San Jose is an hour and a half north on the 101, and Salinas, Monterey, and Carmel are within an hour's drive northwest. When we visited, the area was full of wonderfully rich soil and marine air, and foggy afternoons, at least when you're not in the height of summer. And maybe even then, it's only about 30 miles due west to the Pacific Ocean. This whole area is called the Salinas Valley. It's one of the biggest agricultural areas in the west, in California, and in the country, I'm sure. According to UC Davis's Cooperative Extension website, The Salinas Valley has total crops valued over $1.9 billion, and Monterey County is the fourth highest agricultural producing county in California. 1.4 million agricultural acres of land and production. If you eat ready-to-eat salad mixes, go look on the back of the bag and there's a good chance it says it's from Salinas. Peppers, artichokes, broccoli, celery, Asian veggies, lettuce, strawberries, and spinach are huge. And now wine grapes are getting to be pretty big as well. The Salinas Valley has been called the salad bowl of the world. And John Metzer is right there, raising waterfowl in the salad bowl. (laughs) You know what I mean, but I just had to say it. It feels like there's more quantity and variety of food being produced in his little area than almost any place we've visited. It was kind of awe-inspiring. By the way, when we speak with people across the country, sometimes we talk shop in related areas. And no matter what, pretty much anyone who knew anything about anything foul, haha, either knew of John, had bought from John, or wished they knew John. He's actually a really nice guy on top of being the Goose King. You can tell when we're recording our podcasts in a silly mood or maybe just sleep deprived. In any case, we better just cut to the chase and get the flock out of here. I'm done. Here is John Metzer of Metzer Farms in Gonzales, California. And happy holidays, everyone, whether or not a goose is involved. Uh, So you would please state your name and your title. John Metzer, owner, Metzer Farms. Okay, where are you located? Gonzales, California. If you could uh, give just a description of the climate in the area where, where your farm is. Uh, it's, it's a, we are about 25 miles from the ocean, the Pacific Ocean. We are in the Salinas Valley, a very temperate climate. We get about 12 and a half inches of rain a year. Uh, if it gets to be 80 degrees, we consider it a warm day. Uh, we probably get six nights that it will frost. So it's a very moderate climate, uh, excellent for ducks. They don't like it too hot. Um, yes, they might like the rain, but that messes things up, so we don't mind for the ducks that it doesn't rain much. We need the rain for watering them. Uh, but that is our climate. We, ha- we do not experience uh, snow and rarely does it get over 100 degrees. So we're blessed with our weather here. And you are also blessed with an agricultural community here. Yes. Describe the, the area here, please. Yeah, it, uh, the Salinas Valley is considered the salad bowl of the world, is what they say. Um, the predominant crops here are lettuces. Uh, there's more fruits coming in, strawberries, blueberries. But uh, historically, it's broccoli, cauliflower, celery, uh, Brussels sprouts, artichoke, uh, all the leaf lettuces, iceberg lettuce, romaine lettuce, um, all of the vegetable products. So. There's um, production year-round. They're harvesting broccoli and cauliflower year-round here. Uh, the lettuces are typically from March through November. Uh, and so it's a, it's a very intensive agricultural. Uh, there, there's a lot of people in the area. Uh, 
because of the agriculture we have. Uh, it takes a lot of manpower. So we're lucky in that regard in that at least we have a, a, quite a few people in the area that we can hire when we need help, which is quite a bit. You have a nice distribution chain too here, it seems like, maybe. Yes, we um, ship in a, a multitude of ways and sell in a multitude of ways. We have our own website, so obviously we sell in that method. Uh, we also sell to feed stores that in turn sell to their customers. We also drop ship for other hatcheries, um, so they'll advertise our birds under their name and then we will ship for them. Um, and so they're sort of like, we consider our, our salespeople. Uh, many hatcheries started with chickens and then to make a complete product mix, they said, well, we need ducks and geese. And so uh, we work with quite a few hatcheries supplying their ducks and geese for them. We, we do not ship to the hatchery, we ship directly to their customer. Um, and then the, the products we sell, we, we, since we have a wide variety of breeds, we have 18 breeds of ducks and about 17 breeds of geese. Um, they're sold to people for backyards and pets. Uh, people see a pond and they say, oh, I want to get some ducks to go on the pond. Or they have a vineyard or orchard or a large garden and they want to get rid of slugs and snails and they say, well, we need some ducks. Or they want to get rid of grass and so they say we need geese. And so we sell a lot for that purpose and we also sell a large number of birds for uh, meat production. So every week we are selling Pekin ducklings throughout the United States, uh, predominantly by mail. We also use air freight to people that grow them for meat. So we might have a customer gets uh, 120 every three weeks or a customer gets 3,000 every week or somebody that gets 1,200 once a year uh, of our Pekin ducks. And so we get our breeding stock from France um, and we import breeding stock every three months to make sure we have the best pecan. And so we ship in two different ways of the day-old birds. The vast majority are mailed uh, throughout the United States. Uh, we deliver them to a distribution center and then oftentimes they go on FedEx uh, and then FedEx will deliver them to the city, the ultimate destination network city. Uh, and then they hand them off to the post office and the post office delivers them. So it's a two-day process. We mail on Monday. They typically arrive Wednesday morning. Air freight is for those larger customers that are willing to go to the airport. Uh, the advantage is that the birds get there the next day. So we can ship them on Monday and they will arrive on Tuesday at the airport, which for a commercial producer that's growing them for meat or whatever, there is advantages to getting them on food and water as soon as you can. Uh, list some of the heritage breeds that you have. We have a variety of heritage breeds um, in terms of the ducks. The, the ones that are most commonly considered heritage breeds would be the Saxony, the Silver Apple Yard, the Cayuga, the Buff, potentially the Blue Swedish, some of the Runners. Uh, those are more rare breeds. Um, it is interesting in that I believe the American Poultry Association definition of as a heritage breed is that it is, um, it was a breed in the early 1900s. Well, the Pekin breed of duck has probably been around for thousands of years. And so technically, I guess it's a heritage breed, but it's a commercial bird also. So that's what makes the waterfowl world different than the chicken and turkey world in that the waterfowl world is a little different than the chicken and turkey world in that we are still commercially using purebred ducks and geese for meat and egg production. Whereas in the turkey world and the chicken world, they've crossed different breeds to achieve what they feel is the best bird. But we're still using purebred birds. The Pekin duck, which is the duck that's used predominantly for meat production in the world, is a breed. And it's been around for probably a thousand or more years. So it qualifies as a heritage breed, but it's not rare by any means. Um, and even in the goose world, the Emden goose, which has been around for probably hundreds of years, if not longer, is the main breed used for meat production. So um, I, I sort of like the idea that we're still using purebred birds 
in, in the waterfowl world for commercial meat production. Well, you explained to me earlier that most of these birds are descended from mallards, in the duck universe anyway. Correct. In, in a way, if you've got multiple um, heritage breeds descended from this one duck and then they are accomplishing their purpose, why fix it if it's not broken? Correct. <laughs> you want me to expand on that? <laughs> well, I mean, is that really the concept behind it? Why, why crossbreed it if it's doing exactly what you need it to do? Yeah, that's true. Um, there, there's really, well, in the, let's say in the Pekin world, there's really no other breed that can stand up to what the Pekin do. Now, are they genetically select, selecting the Pekin duck? Well, definitely. Um, they are improving uh, feed conversion, egg production, all this kind of thing of a Pekin duck. But it's still a Pekin duck. They're not crossing other birds with another, other breeds with the Pekin. They're, they're selecting within the Pekin breed. But uh, you are correct in that all domestic ducks other than Muscovies originate from mallard ducks. And they know this because the only wild duck that has a curly feather on the tail of the male is the mallard. And all domestic ducks from Pekins to Khaki Campbells to Ruin to Blue Swedish to Buff to Runners, the males all have a curly feather. So they all originated from the mallard. So you could, you could say that genetically they, they all, well you accurately say they all started genetically from the same, but they've evolved through breeding efforts of, of people to form different breeds, which is probably not that much different than dogs coming from wolves. And look how much diversification there is in the breeds of dogs. So, um, but it is still important to keep each of those breeds separate in my opinion, because the world is continually changing and the more diversity you have in genetics, the better. Um, because you just don't know what's gonna happen in the future and what might be a valuable trait that a, that a breed has that we don't even recognize at this point. We don't, may not even know it has that trait. But um, I, I, my personal opinion is we, we need to keep as, as much diversity as we can in terms of the breeds of poultry and livestock we have. Uh, I actually want to quickly go back to, you, you said your name and your farm, but you didn't give a little bit of your background. Could you tell me what education you have? Yes, um, went to a community college and then to University of California at Davis, uh, bachelor in uh, uh, animal science. Took a lot of business courses once I decided to come back to the farm. Um, so. Once, once I was done with four years, that was enough. I had friends that went on to be vets and doctors, and I said, good for them, but I'm ready to get into the real world and start to work. When you chose to do this, you mentioned you did this as an adjunct of your dad's hobby, and you moved it into a business. But I also understand that you may have been into different types of animals, maybe, uh, maybe ruminants or cattle. Yeah. Or, was ducks a natural thing to move into, or was that kind of a hard transition for you? Well, when I was in high school, I had... 60 or 70 registered Suffolk ewes, and, and which was a large flock in a high school. Uh, but I sold market lambs for 4 H fairs and this kind of thing. And so that really interested me. And when I went to the university, I thought that my ultimate uh, profession would be research at a four year school, at a college, University of Nebraska, or some such place, working with cattle. Um, but then a gentleman came to my father during my junior year when I was away at school and said, uh, oh, I see you have a hobby with ducks. I'd like to buy 10,000 duck eggs a week, a month from you, which was an astronomical number. And so my dad shared that with me. And then we did some thinking and said, well, maybe there's a business in this. And so I stayed with the animal science degree. And as I said, I took a lot of business courses, accounting and marketing and production and this kind of thing. Um, so that I was better prepared. And so when I came back, I turned my dad's hobby of 300 ducks uh, into several thousand the first year, and we've been expanding ever since. Now you have a big advantage even in that you found your niche market and you've, you have enough business savvy to where you've, you've really expanded this into something that's, that's marketable. Um, but one of the big problems is, is that, that farmers that choose to breed, breed heritage breeds for whatever reason have to compete with commercial farmers, and so they have to find their niche markets. 
do you see difficulties with heritage breeds being able to exist uh, in the long term, or do you think the niche market just has to be there for them to make it? Well, people can sustain a breed as a hobby, but then you're dependent on a lot of small flocks and um, that there's enough demand for those eggs or whatever that they can sell them at least cover some of their expenses. The, I, in my opinion, the ideal way is to make it economical for them to raise those breeds, that they have something unique enough about those breeds um, or, or in their area that they can make some money. Because if, if you're able to make money with your heritage breeds, it's much more likely that they will be continued, uh, not only f for an individual farmer, but sort of as an industry. So finding a niche market, um, it, is, it is important, I feel, um, and it's not easy, but it is fun uh, going out there with your particular product and uh, extolling its virtues and convincing other people that it really has something that's better than, than others out there. Do you think if you hadn't gone the way of the waterfall fell that you would have gone to some more of a commercial agriculture realm, or do you think that this this is inevitable for you? Your 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 love for the the smaller breeds. Uh, well, I don't have anything against commercial production. Um, I, I, that's necessary. I mean, there's a lot of research that's going on in the commercial industry that is filters down to all of us whether it's uh, feed nutrition or, or uh, medicines or how you manage birds or lighting programs, that all developed from the commercial industry. Uh, so to answer your question, if, I, if the gentleman had never approached my dad, I'm sure I would be involved in commercial. But as a hobby, at least as I visualize it, I, I would have... Uh, whether it be ducks or geese or sheep or something like that, that would be unique and different. That always interested me to have something different. And I'm definitely in that business now because, um, you know, everybody around me is either growing vegetables or wine grapes, and here I am a duck farmer. So everybody knows me as the duck farmer. But the reality is in this world, with the number of people that we have on the planet, you have to have something that's production oriented or we, we all starve to death. Correct. Yeah. Uh, it, it's to utilize the resources you have and the, the land you have and the space you have and to, to be efficient at it. And to some people, to be efficient takes a thousand acres. Well, you can't hold that against them. Um, and to others, such as myself, you know, I need 20 acres. You know, so um, it varies. You, I, I, I think there can the, the the two extremes, or maybe not even extremes. There is a continuum, but from a large commercial production to somebody that only has a few heritage breeds, they can learn from each other and work together. I don't think they're mutually exclusive at all, in my opinion. Uh, one of the animals that we're researching is the Brabant horse. And the draft horse has been he's used by a gentleman in Minnesota or something. And he's a dairy farmer, and he he scaled his you know he he thought bigger always has to be better. I have yeah. to get big. I have to add more cattle on. So he had more and more dairy cattle, more and more. And he's working you know he's in the in the red pretty yeah. much every year until he scaled down and he said you know what now I have 20 cows. I plow with the horses, and I I have found my niche. But I'm I don't have to farm in the same way that Correct. commercial agriculture does. Yeah, yeah. And he's in the black now more than half the time. Right, right. Which is uh, pretty good for farmers. Yeah. <laughs> That's what they're shooting for. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I fully agree that, um, you know, you, you can't look at one system as being better than another system, uh, whether it's getting bigger or getting smaller or whatever. You just have to find what works for you and most critically what your market is because lots of people come to us and say, well, we want to raise ducks. And my first question is always, well, where are you going to sell them? You know, are you selling the meat? Are you selling the eggs? Um, because if you're wanting to make it a business, 
you, you've got to look at the, the, the marketing. You get, who's going to buy this, you know, at what price, that kind of thing. Okay, I did want to talk about the economic viability portion. We were talking about that. And I wanted, I wanted if you would, you to describe some of the things that you sell, your niche market that you found. Oh. Well, we, we, obviously the main things we sell are the day-old ducklings and goslings, uh, but we also sell day-old uh, guinea keats um, that we, uh, we purchase hatching eggs and hatch those every week during the spring. And um, we're also starting to sell some chicks with our focus on the pasture-raised uh, farmers that, you know, again, get a hundred a week or a, a thousand every other week or whatever. Chicks for this purpose. Um, so some of the other products we have that are associated with our business is that we uh, blow, shell, blow eggs and sell the shells to decorators. And we're, we've been selling fresh eggs for years. People contacting us because they might be allergic to chicken eggs and they can eat duck eggs. Um, but we're, we're going to be focusing heavily on selling um, fresh duck eggs. We think there's a real market there because we have two strains of ducks we've developed, they're not breeds, that are very good egg layers. And their redeeming quality is they lay lots of eggs. And we're selling lots of those uh, every year to people that obviously are growing their ducks for egg production, uh, from small farmers to big farmers. And so that falls into what we're doing quite well and being in California. So we're going to be selling, we're going to form a new company for that purpose, Olin Day Farms, named after my father, whose first name was Olin and selling fresh eggs and my son will be working with that. So that, that's definitely a niche market um, to finding those restaurants and bakeries that we feel will really appreciate and utilize duck eggs. Uh, we're, we're trying to inspire a culinary innovation through our duck eggs. I have to admit, I've never tasted a duck egg, but it's my understanding that they're they're great for baking, they're rich or something, yeah. is that true? Yeah, they're more dense, there's less water in the duck egg, so um, th they're more nutrient packed per ounce. Now a duck egg is larger than a chicken egg, but uh, per ounce or per gram there's more nutrients, more proteins, more vitamins, more minerals, there's more fats in them also. So it's some of those characteristics that make it better for baking and a lot of people like the taste better and this kind of thing. I have a big chart back here that talks about the nutrition, uh, the, the nutrient differences in ducks versus chickens. But if you could go over some of those, that'd be great. Well, I'm not as familiar with the meat end of it, uh, but for the egg end of it, uh, duck eggs are much more nutritious per ounce than a chicken egg. Uh, I think it's probably about nine out of eleven of the amino acids. Uh, duck eggs have more. Uh, USDA measured vitamins and minerals and 80% of those that they measured there was more per ounce in a duck egg than in a chicken egg. So they are much more nutritious um, than, uh, than a chicken egg. And they last longer in the refrigerator, is that correct? You're correct, yeah. They've done scientific research that they last much longer. Now, my guess is, is because there's a very strong membrane, shell membrane under the shell that protects it from drying out and from bacteria and stuff like that. So, uh, but they can last weeks longer than chicken eggs in the fridge. So this allergic thing is an interesting concept because I know people that are allergic to cow milk sometimes have fewer issues with goat milk. So you're telling me that its potential is the same for the between ducks and chicken eggs? Yeah. There's many people that are allergic to chicken eggs can use duck eggs. I can't say 100% because we only deal with those that can eat duck eggs. And so they'll buy duck eggs on a regular basis and then freeze them. And most people don't even consider freezing, duck e freezing eggs because they're always available. But if they don't have duck eggs nearby, they'll buy a, a box of 20 or 40 eggs and then put some in the freezer. Um, and then they can pull them out when they need them and, and use them and have no allergic reactions. If I were to make a two-egg omelet, is that 
roughly equal to one duck egg? Is it like an egg and a half of a standard chicken egg? Is it full duck egg? What I would egg? probably say, you know, two duck eggs is three chicken eggs. And it depends on the breed. Um, because we devised our own egg sizes because there's nothing for chicken eggs. Um, and so our peewee duck eggs are about the size of an extra large chicken egg. Um, and, and it varies. I mean, um, a mallard egg is probably 70 grams, which is probably an extra large chicken egg. And then you go to khaki Campbell's that are in the 75 to 80 grams. And then most of the other breeds are in the 80 grams. And then you pecans are in the 90 to 95 grams. So a pecan egg could be twice the size of a medium chicken egg. So it all depends on the breed of, of duck egg. There's a lot more variability in duck egg sizes than chicken egg sizes. So what do duck eggs run? What does it cost? Um, in the store, I, I think they normally run 90 cents to, um, 80 cents to a dollar or more per egg. Yeah, if you're just going and buying them one or two. Now, some places sell them half dozen, dozen. Uh, it, it, it sort of varies, so I, I don't know if I have a, a blanket statement of how much they are, but they're definitely more than chicken eggs because they're not... <clears throat> Ducks do better on the ground, uh, whereas with chickens they can be put in cages, but ducks don't, don't do well in cages. They can't handle the wire floor. And so you have a lot more expense if you're keeping birds on the ground. You can't put as many in a building. And uh, so there's some inherent, inherent expenses with ducks that you're not going to have with chickens. So they'll, we'll, we'll never be, be competing against chicken eggs. We'll be providing an alternative experience with duck eggs or a higher quality of, of food product. The, the accountant in me says, okay, if they're larger in general than a chicken egg, and I'm a chicken person, so if they're larger and if they last longer, so I could technically buy them in quantity if I really wanted to and therefore reduce the price, and the nutrient value is higher, then really if I'm paying for nutrients, that might actually pencil to be fairly close to a, a, an equal value in some ways. It could be. Yeah, I haven't pursued it in that manner, but... Um... You could, eat, I, I would think you might be able to justify it that way. You know, I think what we're looking for is people that want to try something new or different, uh, a, an alternative taste, an alternative product. You know, we're not going to be trying to pencil it out dollars and cents comparing chicken eggs and duck eggs, uh, at least initially. But um, they, they are a very, uh, uh, they lay lots of eggs, you know, it, sh it shouldn't be surprising to get over 300 eggs from a duck in a year of laying. Uh, it may not be consistently that number, but you will have birds that will lay that number of eggs. Now that actually brings me to, to something else that I read on your website. You were talking about using geese as as uh, as weed control, mm -hmm. and, and that's one of the functions. Again, you have fewer tools, but this one might actually work to some extent. Does a weed or geese actually do what you're claiming it does as a weed? Yes, uh, the first choice of geese is grass. They love grass. So typically in the past, when geese were used in large quantities, uh, 40 years ago they were being used here in California in the cotton. Cotton is a broadleaf. They had Johnson grass, which was a grass. So if they put the geese in the field, the geese would naturally eat the grass and leave the cotton alone. Uh, they don't do that so much anymore, but it was, it was a very good system. Now there's other people that have other weeds that they want to get rid of. And so what we recommend is that when they're growing those young goslings, to provide that weed to them as they're growing, so they develop a taste for it. And it's much more likely, even if it's a broadleaf, for them to eat that weed when they're released into the field. So you can do some training with geese. Naturally, they like grass, but they can be trained to eat some other broadleafs also. So they are very functional in that regard, and obviously they're spreading manure and 
um, you know, providing you meat and eggs if you want to carry it that far also. I mean, there's some, there's some outside of the box uh, or the, the typical box that people think um, functions for some of these animals. The ducks are great at pest control, correct? Yeah. We, we've sold them to vineyards, uh, some asparagus farms, uh, citrus orchards uh, to get rid of slugs and snails because that's, that's the candy to a, a duck is, is slugs and snails. They'll go for those anytime. They'll probably leave a pile of grain if there's slugs or snails moving around. So that's their first choice. So if anybody has a slug or snail problem, um, the ducks will take care of that. This explains a lot because my folks had a, had a, a, a large yard and we had ducks always come in the swimming pool and then, and then forage. So, yeah. uh, but we had a lot of snails too. So that, that really explains that's where, the, where they would come. They were probably looking for slugs and snails. That, that's their joy in life is finding those. Now they'll eat other bugs along the way, but that's probably what they're looking for in the, you know, the, the moist leaves and under plants and some of those little moister areas where uh, slugs and snails proliferate. Fantastic. And both the ducks and the geese leave you nice little piles of nitrogen. That's right. That's right. <laughs> okay, so tell me about a couple of the other things, please, that you supply. Tell me about Balut. Balut? Balut. Yep. Balut is a partially incubated duck egg. And we've been selling Balut since the very beginning of Metzer Farms 40 years ago. Uh, it is a partially incubated duck egg. So a duck egg takes 28 days to hatch. We will incubate it uh, 17 days, take it out of the incubator and sell it at that point. And then they are typically boiled and eaten out of the shell. Uh, many people that were in uh, Vietnam uh, during the war are familiar with it being sold on the street or many people that might have been in the Philippines. It's oftentimes sold in the street as hot dogs are here in the bigger cities. So it's considered nutritious, uh, aphrodisiac, uh, they like the taste. Uh, so that is, it's a very common food item uh, for Filipinos and, and Vietnamese. And we've been, we've been producing it every week, as I said, for, for 40 years. And it works well for us that we can uh, produce a lot of eggs and then decide at day 17, well, what are we going to hatch and what are we going to sell for balut? So we can sort of overproduce to ensure we have enough ducklings. And I noticed while we were up here, this is a rather diverse demographic in, in the Salinas area. Mm -hmm. I would think, did, did, did you take this into account when you thought about the different things you were going to market? Or is that, did that just magically kind of facilitate your marketing? Well, <laughs> the diversity probably introduced us to Balut because, as I said, my father had ducks as a hobby. And he was hatching a few ducklings just to hatch and sell to local feed stores. And he walked into the feed store one day, and Mr. Collier, the owner of the Collier feed store, said, Well, Mr. Metzer, why don't you meet uh, in, in Mr. Enriquez here because he wants Balut. And my dad said, Well, what are Balut? And so my father and Mr. Enriquez got together and figured out how long an egg had to be incubated. So Mr. Enriquez was a, a Filipino gentleman. And so if it wasn't for Mr. Enriquez, we probably never would have been introduced to Balut and, you know, all those little things that add into and direct a life story that you don't even realize until years later. And there's, there's a large Hispanic uh, population here. And um, we do sell fresh eggs to a store that has quite a few Hispanics buying there. Uh, so we're not sure what the market is there, but it's something we want to explore. Life is interesting with these different cultures and these different characteristics. I mean, it, things that become muddied after a while lose the crispness of the flavor, whether mm -hmm. that be traveling to China or that, that be, you know, learning about Balut. Do you see any parallels between heritage breeds and our diverse demographic or a diversity in society? Well, I've never considered them at the, in, at the same time, but I think it all boils down to 
um, diversity is good in that it, it supplies different thoughts or different building blocks, you know, whether it's a, a, a different race or different culture, they look at things differently or a different breed has different capabilities, but you still want those unique breeds as building blocks. Um, you can build a multitude of structures, but you all, everybody uses two by fours and in a wood structure. And so it's, you're going back to your basics and you're almost a, something was designed for a purpose, almost like with some of the breeds that the khaki camel is a good egg laying breed and this is a good meat breed. Well, if you start to cross them, then you're losing some of those unique characteristics of each breed. And so you don't want to make everything fit for everybody. You want some unique breeds, just as the fascination of unique um, cultures or viewpoints or how people solve problems. So um, I, can, I can see a connection in the thought process for the two. And I've noticed that many of the farmers that we speak to say it doesn't mean you can't it, you can't mix everything. You can. That makes it interesting. That maybe I do want a pig that has a good bacon fat and a good belly fat, you know, and or a good ham. But I have to have that ingredient to go back to. And if I if that's the only thing I have, then I'm stuck. Correct. Yeah, yeah. It takes a lot of it takes a lot of work to if if everything's crossed. It takes a lot of work to, to, to parcel them out and try to get your pre, pure breeds again. It would be a very difficult, time-consuming process. It's better to keep them separate from the beginning. And luckily, we're able to contribute to that. Um, I mean, we have a business. We're large. But we are able to supply heritage breeds of ducks and geese to people that to want them specifically for that particular breed. They don't have to be searching you know, phoning people and the county extension agents and the 4-H and who has this breed, um, we can supply that breed to them. So we are a somewhat of a depository, I don't know if that's the right term, for some of these breeds, a, a, a quantity of these breeds are large enough. Do you ever feel like you're a little mini UN because a Toulouse is obviously <laughs> what a French <laughs> Goose, yeah. and a Pekin is a Chinese yeah. duck. Yeah, yeah, So you kind of have a little global representation right. here. Right, right. Yeah, we have, yeah, uh, on our website we have the origin of many of the different, of each breed we have. And it's interesting the different countries from which they've come. Uh, a few from the United States, but not very many. Well, the 3,000, right? Is that <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and what's interesting is that to me is that the geese that have a knob on their head originate in China and those without a knob originate in, in Europe, uh, the gray leg goose in, in Europe. Well, the African breed is from China, but it's called African. And in going back in the history of the breed, it was brought here in the early 1900s. And so they felt that it was a, a breed that was unique and different. And at that time, things from Africa with Teddy Roosevelt were new and different in Africa. So they bring a goose from China and name it African. So it's, uh, it's sort of a funny story, but that's, you know, the person that designed it, that thought up the name African, they were, they were responding to a market. They thought they were gonna be able to sell something because it has a unique name, even though it came from China. Well, we're big fans of renaming things as we choose because I believe the, you know, the American Mustang, which is known as the Americana, I think that's a Spanish horse. And I right. think the Spaniards got it from somewhere. Yeah, like they're probably Central Asia or somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It, it seems that we are a true melting pot in many ways. Yes, yeah. yeah. No, I, I agree with that. You know, Dr. Sponenberg said, he's a phrase that I absolutely love. He says, we call ourselves a melting pot, but we're kind of like a big stew pot. Because there's still chunks. Yeah, yeah. They're distinct. Yeah, 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 yeah. And th and that's the way I think it, that that's a real value. Yeah. yeah. So I just quickly I'd like to get into the into the 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 culling and the the targeted breeding. Do you do you cull actively with your ducks? Yes. Yeah. 
Um, obviously, there's some selection that goes on at hatching itself by the appearance of the ducklings at hatching. Uh, and then as they grow and mature, then we are uh, selecting for those that are meet the breed standards along the way. And then the final selection is right when they go into the breeding house. So I, I don't know what percent selection I would say we're culling, oh, 10% of the birds that, that, are, that we start to raise. Why is this important? To maintain a uniformity in the breed, um, because it's, I mean, that's the value of a unique breed in that it's unique and that it carries certain characteristics. And do you feel like these are characteristics that you improve over time or you maintain? I would hope there's some improvement. I mean, you definitely want to maintain, but there might be some improvement. Um, most of our birds are not shown at fairs. There are some that are shown at fairs, um, but I put a little bit more value over production characteristics that they can walk and move around and breed and eat correctly and not get too overweight and the correct size. Uh, we don't show any birds ourselves. I have no problem with people showing birds. I think that's a would be a great hobby and there's thousands of people that enjoy that. Um, but I want to make sure mine are, they can reproduce and thrive in, in environments. Purpose and function. Yes. Yes. Um, one of the purposes is, to, is for food production. Do you have any connection with the Slow Food Arc of Taste at all? No. Do you have any connection with the restaurants? Uh, high, I would think the high-end restaurants would come to you for quite a few things. Well, we'll be going to them for the fresh eggs because, again, we don't process any birds ourselves. So we're selling them to other people that they're in contact with the restaurants. But now that we're going to start selling the fresh duck eggs through Olin Day Farms, uh, we'll be in more contact with restaurants. Um, the last thing I'd like to ask you about is uh, we're, we're not, obviously we're not sponsored by or connected with the Livestock Conservancy, but we are members because yeah. we believe that they have a good mission. Why, why are you a member of that, um, that organization? I think the goals of the organization are extremely valid today and very important to maintain diversity um, uh, because once a breed is lost, then it's pretty much gone. It would, I suppose you could bring a breed back, but it, it would take a tremendous amount of breeding and effort to do that. So uh, the, the, the diversity of breeds and inspiring people to enjoy a diversity of breeds uh, and to uh, expose them to breeds that might do better in their environment, I think is important, so that there is a selection process, that we're not down to, you know, four breeds of cattle and one breed of duck and two breeds of geese. Um, diversity is the spice of life. Uh, you know, as I had said earlier, how many breeds of dogs do we really need to have but there's hundreds of them out there because people enjoy a little Chihuahua or a Great Dane. That's the kind they want. And so we're doing the same thing with the Livestock Conservancy, uh, enabling breeds to be conserved, not only for genetics in the future about something we, we may have no idea about a need now, but to allow people to express themselves or to have a breed that they better identify with or that they enjoy the color or the characteristics of. I think it's really important. Do you think that in any way it might be possible that this would save our future? That we need genetics for either pest resistance or drought tolerance or anything else in the future we don't know about now? I think it's very possible. You know, I, I can't predict that um, because there's there's been a tremendous amount of progress in the commercial agricultural industry in terms of, you know, corn yield, wheat yield, you know, uh, broiler production, the amount of uh, meat that's produced for the amount of food going into it. So 
th there's been a tremendous amount of progress in the, the larger commercial agricultural world with those items. But you never know when something might be needed because of climate change or a disease or something that m the, one of these heritage breeds might possess that would, might be the key link. So whether they're going to save mankind, I can't tell you that. <laughs> but, you know, if, 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 if I can make a living to support myself and all my employees and people are enjoying the ducks and the geese they're getting from us, that's a win-win. And we're also preserving breeds. So th it's a win-win-win process in that regard. Just a quick personal note here. Baby geese and ducks are just about the cutest damn things ever. I'm going to make Rick post something tomorrow with a video clip from our visit with John Metzer. I'm not a gushy person about stuff like that, but they are just plain cute. And one more note. When they are full grown, they are feisty. They are territorial and they can be just plain mean. I've read stories of flocks of geese being used on military bases in Germany as an early warning klaxon, as they set up this crazy racket when somebody they don't know comes within range. I kind of think they're misused in that case, as I think I'd face a soldier with a gun before I'd face an angry flock of geese. Personal experience. The poop on the lawn wasn't the only reason we were scared to go outside in the backyard that summer at my house. Wild goose chase means something completely different to some of us here. I'm just saying. If you liked our podcast, please subscribe. This is how we keep going. And please tell your friends to join us. Please feel free to post any questions or comments that you might have to our social media sites. Our Twitter feed is at Backyard Green Films, spelled B-K-Y-R-D-G-R-E-E-N-F-I-L-M-S. Our Instagram is at Backyard Green Films, B-A-C-K-Y-A-R-D-G-R-E-E-N-F-I-L-M-S. Our Facebook is Backyard Green Films. Our YouTube URL is youtube.com Backyard Green Films. We'd like to thank John for giving us a tour of his farm and for sitting down for this interview with us today. If you'd like more information about John and his farm, please visit MetzerFarms.com. That is spelled M-E-T-Z-E-R. You have been listening to Agriculture with your host, Alara Bowman. Please tune in for more upcoming episodes from our travels. I'm Rick Bowman, your behind-the-scenes editor. Until next time. Also, if you'd like to find out more about the waterfowl world and heritage breeds, please visit livestockconservancy.org. This has been a presentation of Backyard Green Films Productions, all rights reserved, copyright 2019.